The era of interactive fiction games for the Bond franchise had come to an end with Goldfinger, and it was time to get back to some standard video gaming. The production company Domark had originally released a computer game for A View to a Kill back in 1985, and it was now time for them to give it another go. A View to a Kill was a very lackluster game that was way too unfocused, as it was like three completely different games rolled into one. They were trying something different, but ultimately it didn't work out all too well critically. Domark eventually went with designer Richard Naylor to create a game to be released at the same time as the new Bond film, The Living Daylights. Originally planned as a June of 1987 release along with the film, the game came out three months later in September. Ian Fleming wrote Octopussy and The Living Daylights, meant to be two stories in a new anthology, but he passed away before they were finished in 1964. The book was released with the title posthumously in 1966, along with two other short stories, The Property of a Lady and 007 in New York. It was Fleming's final book release. The Living Daylight short story is retold in the film, but only a very small portion of it, mostly near the beginning. The Living Daylights was the first Bond film to star the now fourth theatrical Bond actor, Timothy Dalton. After Roger Moore left and things didn't work out with Pierce Brosnan, the franchise had their new 007. Along with Dalton, the film stars Miriam Diabo, Joe Don Baker, and future Lord of the Rings alum John Rhys Davies. Bond is sent to help KGB officer Koskov escape by stopping his assassin, but after finding out said assassin is beautiful cellist Kara Malovi, Bond intervenes and eventually gets involved in a plot involving foreign spies, not knowing who he can really trust. The tone of the two Dalton era films were a lot darker and more serious than the more lighthearted tongue in cheek Roger Moore era. While it did bring a bit more money than A View to a Kill, The Living Daylights is the fourth least profitable film in the series. The late 80s remained the low point of the franchise overall. But a video game was still ready to happen. At this point, the Nintendo Entertainment System was a huge success and revitalized the video game industry, and computers were gradually becoming more powerful each year. The Living Daylights was released for the Amstrad CPC, the newer Amstrad PCW, a return to the Atari 8-bit, a newcomer to the series, the BBC Micro, and the old standbys with the Commodore 64, MSX, and ZX Spectrum. Let's check out the back of the box. The cast. Brad Whitaker, international arms dealer and megalomaniac. Necros, his ruthless sidekick killer. Koskov, double dealing KGB general. And the beautiful Kara, the sophisticated Czech cellist who wins the hero's heart. Match them against James Bond, renowned British secret agent, for whom love and death is a way of life. And you have all the ingredients for a super spy story, and a great gripping game. This game is closely based on the all-action film and coin-op arcade game from Arcadia, but puts you in the action as you control James Bond through eight fast and furious levels. Moving from Gibraltar to Afghanistan, you encounter the SAS, friendly, the KGB, not so friendly, Enemy helicopters, very unfriendly, and even a milkman with exploding bottles. Now go ahead and join James Bond, living on the edge. So there's the intro for the Commodore 64 version. Firstly, it's a bit disappointing that there's no Bond theme or gun barrel sequence, but alright, it's a new game. On to the first mission. Level 1, Gibraltar. Bond begins his adventure with a test of the defenses on the island of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean. He must match his wits against the skills of the SAS armed only with a pink pellet gun. After all, it is only a mock battle. Or is it? Could one of the SAS men really be an enemy in disguise? Take care, he is out to kill! It's kind of funny that they answered the question right there. Yes, there is an enemy in disguise. So let's check it out. Gibraltar does somewhat follow the film with Bond being involved in a paintball training exercise, but there is an assassin present using real bullets. And you play through that scene here. He uses the old joystick controls from a view to a kill and use it to control the crosshairs. You can aim all over the screen trying to shoot your fellow soldiers with a paintball gun. It plays out sort of like Duck Hunt or any light gun game, except you're using a joystick instead of a gun controller. 
If you enjoy those games, you could get something out of this. Also, every weapon in this game has unlimited ammo and never needs to be reloaded. That's something that will obviously change in the future. Bond's health is shown in the bottom right, and it's important to pay attention to it. To jump, you make sure the crosshairs are to the edge of the screen, and then aim diagonal up and fire at the same time. To do a barrel roll, do a barrel roll. press diagonal and down. It took some getting used to, but then it became easy. But only having one button does make things difficult to pull off effectively. Once I started to figure out the controls, it became a bit of fun, if a little repetitive. You continue on, shooting green soldiers that pop out in the background while jumping over rocks in your path. The problem with the controls occur when you're moving. To move to the right, the crosshairs have to be to the right edge of the screen. Therefore, if someone appears on the left, you have to drag the crosshairs all the way to the other side of the screen, and then back to the right to keep moving. Also, you can be trying to aim on the far right and accidentally start running, putting you in danger of tripping. Jumping over rocks is essential, because tripping on one takes a lot of health. You continue to shoot green guys until the assassin appears in gray. You have to think fast, immediately aim where it says paintball on your HUD screen, and then switch to your Walter PPK and shoot him with a real bullet before he kills you, and you win the level. It's not a bad start to the game, and it's easily better than anything in A View to a Kill, in my opinion. You are then taken to Q's lab after each level, in which you are to select a secondary weapon or equipment. Your options for Mission 2 are a Missile Pen, the infamous Ghetto Blaster, a Grenade, or Infrasight. I didn't know what to expect for the rest of the game, but I see Mission 2 is titled Concert Hall. Can you get the Russian defector Koskov away from his KGB guards without injuring any of the music lovers enjoying the show inside? Koskov will follow you, but it's up to you to defend him from the snipers who appear all over the building. Get him out of the area quickly. It seems to be following the film enough, and I can appreciate that. So, I didn't read any of this before starting the level, I just went right into it. It struck me as funny, because I was shooting anybody I saw, and I even said to myself, Boy, it's a good thing Bond is sure that these shadowy figures in the background are all enemies, because he is murdering a lot of them. But apparently I did okay, because I didn't fail. You're supposed to select the infrasight to determine who the bad guys are, and who the citizen concert goers are, and I did not know this. To my surprise, it plays just like level 1 does, except Koskov follows you around. After a view to a kill having completely different play styles between each level, I wasn't sure what to expect for level 2. Your object is to shoot the bad guys, jump over the sewer gates, and survive by going all the way to the right. That's about it. At this point, it was clear that the rest of the game was going to play out about the same. You move the crosshairs around the screen to shoot enemies, pick up the right gadget from Q Lab, move to the right, jump over whatever signature object the level throws at you. It does sort of follow the movie enough, at least with what they're given. So rather than describing the entire game, I'll give a very brief rundown. If you want to check out the game for yourself without spoilers, then stop here. But I mean, it's kinda hard to spoil a 33 year old arcade style computer game, but anyway. The pipeline adds the difficulty of men at the top throwing... discs? Pipes? I don't know, at you, and there are steam valves that you have to dodge. The mansion involves moving to the right while dodging milk bottles being thrown by Necros in disguise. Yes, that's a thing. Shoot him and destroy the helicopters. The fairground is even more wacky. You stand in one spot and you shoot balloons with a crossbow, and then you shoot the clown with your gun. I don't know. Tangier is more back to basics, with moving to the right and shooting enemies while jumping between buildings. Afghanistan is basically the same thing, but with tanks and barbed wire in the background. Finally, Whitaker's house is the epilogue of the film, so to speak. You dodge Whitaker's sticks or whatever he's throwing at you, and then you shoot him until he dies. The congratulations screen commences with some well-deserved thank yous from the Prime Minister. So that's The Living Daylights. In a weird way, you could argue that this is the first real James Bond game. James Bond 007 and A View to a Kill were before this, of course, but this is the game that started the style of moving through a level and shooting a large quantity of enemies until you reach the end. There are so many Bond games that play out this way, and it all started here, with The Living Daylights. It's definitely not a bad game, and again, it's so much more fun than A View to a Kill was. You can get through it pretty quickly before it gets too repetitive. I mean, the fairground level alone can be completed in like 40 seconds. But it's a pretty cool game to check out if you have the means to do so. I think it would have worked out better in a large arcade console that takes quarters, but these Bond games are strictly for old school computer games for the time being. It's definitely a step in the right direction for the game series, though.
Next up, we have another movie tie-in, but we're going back in time 15 years earlier, strangely enough. The next Dalton film wouldn't come out until 1989, so there is one official release in 1988. I really appreciate all of you who have stuck with me through this Bond retrospective journey. Any likes and subscribes are highly appreciated, and it's what keeps me wanting to go through these. James Bond will return in Live and Let Die.